Good afternoon, and thank you very much for your welcome. Um, this is what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I've only got 20 minutes, and I could talk for hours, so I'm going to go really fast through this. Talk a bit about past, present, and future in terms of the context of London. Now the past, London Underground um, celebrated its 150th anniversary just a few weeks ago and the top picture there shows a steam train to mark that event running through the original route. What that tells us is that London Underground was first um, and from that everyone has learnt what they should do right um, from what has gone on in London. So 1863, the first underground railway in the world. 1900 brought around the first tubes, the deep bore tubes, with three more in 1906. 1933 was a landmark when the first tube map was published, and that was the world's first of actually showing an integrated network to help the customers. 1969, the Victoria Line was opened, first railway in the world with automatic train operation, um, which everyone has now followed. 1983, we brought about a revolution in ticketing. Before then, you had to buy an individual ticket. We then introduced the travel card, which meant you could buy one ticket and travel anywhere. 2007 hit one billion journeys on the underground. So that's the underground. That's sort of the past, the legacy that we have in London. Um, I'm now going to talk about London Overground, which is one of the newest um, services in London, um, for which I'm actually responsible for myself personally. Now, Overground is London's only orbital rail network. The last bit shown in dotted there on the map was actually opened by the Mayor, Boris Johnson, on the 10th of December. So we've been running that now for about two months. Uh, and after one month, we had a million passengers already travelled on it. But it has, like lots in London, a, a real legacy, a real history. Some old pictures are there, what it was like. Um, and Transport for London was formed in the year 2000, and in TfL we had the vision of actually doing something about these underutilized and underinvested railways. So in 2005, the government gave us the authority, the ability to take over rail services in London. So that's when the concept of London, under, London Overground was first formed. Uh, and that shows a picture of one of our new stations that we built. So on, on the left there, you can see the old trains with graffiti. Um, on the right, you can see the new trains that we introduced um, in the last five years. Um, again, for us, a UK first, when we had open wide gangways, something that Asian metros and be doing, and Dubai does here, where you can walk right through the train, but this was a first for the UK. We also introduced new stations. On the left, there's a new station. Um, on the bottom right was Rotherhide, again, a station from 1865 that we refurbished. So a right mix of new and old to bring in new services. But what has this actually done? When you look at what customers think about it, in the five years that we've been operating as London Overground, we celebrated our fifth birthday last November, we have seen a 400% increase in customer demand. There's something there that we have, have actually tapped into and, and brought customers. Not only has the demand gone up, the customer satisfaction has gone up. You can see that where we are and back in uh, 2007, we've gone up and we've overtaken other parts of the, of the network, even London Underground. We have a higher customer satisfaction now. And again, the growth, you can see 10 points in, in, those, in that customer satisfaction. So it's something that we've done that's actually met with our customers. When you dig into that and look at what do the customers actually appreciate, um, condition of the station has gone up from 67 points up to 83. Personal safety, we found that the new trains with the open gangways right through. C customers feel much safer in that. Um, you can see the new trains have gone up 57 percentage points to 86, the difference that that has made. And the one at the bottom, which is, I think, one of the most important, is punctuality. The train service delivers what we said it would do. The other thing we've done, of course, is we had op an open system. We've introduced ticket gates to actually make our customers pay for what they're using. Um, some of them might not like that, but actually, you can see how our ticketless travel has dropped. Um, and that, of course, generates brings us increased revenue. 
When you look at the, what has caused this significant impact on demand, this, this graph sort of gives, gives it all away. Background growth was there. But actually, by investing in the service quality and giving the performance, you've got a major contribution, providing more trains. Um, we've upped the frequency now so that, on, for instance, the North London line, we're running eight trains an hour, where we used to run about three. Connectivity, by having a, an orbital network now, we now connect into other parts of the transport system, mainline rail and with London Underground and with Docklands Light Railway. So now passengers can make new journeys. And then with marketing, by actually selling ourselves. So those are the contributions of the factors of how we've increased that customer demand. I couldn't stand up here and talk about what we did without mentioning the Olympics. Last summer, we saw the world as our customer. And everyone said, transport's going to be awful in London. We even had a, what I now call a failed presidential candidate from the USA saying, it won't work. We proved all the detractors wrong. We made London smile, we said. How did we do it? Well, when we look at it, it was a mess, massive challenge to us. 26 world championships going on at once. 9 million Olympic Games spectac spectators. 2 million for the Paralympics. 300,000 athletes. And of course, this was badged and we won the uh, Games on the basis this would be the first ever public transport Games in the world. When you look at the numbers, it wasn't just Stratford where the Olympic Stadium was. We had 200,000 people in and out every day to Olympic Park at Stratford, 90,000 at Wembley. So all around the network, there were lots of passenger movements. Look at the Olympic Park itself. You can see how that was spread out between the, the, the main stadium with 80,000, the aquatic center, the velodrome all of those moving in and out. And of course, with the, the Olympic Stadium, you had two sets of, of spectators in, one in the morning, one in the evening. So during the middle of the day, you had all the 80,000 coming out and another 80,000 coming in. We had three peaks, effectively, a morning peak, an evening peak, and a nighttime peak. And the challenge was how could we deliver that to make the service robust, how could we get everyone home at night? So, of course, as you can imagine, there was a huge amount of planning gone in. And I've just got some of the graphs that were used. This picks out, picks out day seven. For instance, throughout the day, the estimated number of passengers going in and out uh, at one particular location. But planning clearly showed us we needed to lessen the impact. So we did travel demand management. We communicated. We got a publicity campaign um, to, to, to make people think about their journeys, looked at how we can manage the stations better. We introduced one-way systems at different times of the day, and they would switch during depending on the demand and what was going on on the events. And travel demand management, a lot of emphasis working with businesses in London to try and get people in London to work at home, to use different tra travel paths, to start earlier, to finish earlier. Uh, even our commissioner uh, won an award, I think, for uh, encouraging everyone to stay late and take a, have a beer before they went home after work. So that's what we did. This shows, for instance, Canary Wharf, one station, which is sort of a new financial district for London, showing that the demand throughout the, the Olympic period and where the hotspots would be. So there we had station demand management where we made a one-way system. So you could only go in one exit and out another. We also did works at stations, Stratford being the main station for the Olympic Park. Um, and we did the work and we finished it by the end of 2010. And the secret there was finish the works well in advance of the event. That gave us the ability then to test the, test the infrastructure, to test out the events and prove it all worked. We added in new infrastructure, new bridges, new links. West Ham was a, 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 near, a station near to Olympic Park. A lot of emphasis was put on there to get people to get off there and to walk rather than go through Stratford. And signage, the whole of the network was covered with magenta signs to actually get customers, visitors, knowing where each venue was and what you would get off. And the maps in the trains were changed to have these magenta logos on them. And resourcing, um, in the TFL, 
for the duration of Olympic Games and the Paralympics, we cancelled all routine meetings. We got everyone out of the office. We could. We had 3,500 volunteers, even myself, put on a magenta waistcoat and was out there at Stratform working with the customers. So we mobilised the workforce. They were volunteers alongside the games makers that everyone heard about uh, in the Olympic Park and the other venues. And we communicated to all the staff. Picture there of Mike Brown, the managing director of Rail and London Underground. He gave over 120 sessions, afternoon and morning sessions. He even did nighttime sessions to do with the night shift that people would normally work overnight, maintain the railway, to communicate to all the staff the importance of delivery. Um, a huge investment, but it all paid off. And of course, accessibility, not only for the Paralympic Games, but also the, the visitors. Um, and we promoted it as not only being the public transport game, but the most accessible, accessible ever games. And brought into light there, it shows Westminster, the fireman's lift at the back of house. That was brought into customer use. And we communicated with, with those with disabilities to, with using films on the website so they could understand how that they would uh, be able to travel on the system. And of course, we carried the torch on a special train. Um, of course, all the safety issues had to be dealt with with a flame, live flame inside of a, a train, but we did it. And that's left us with a legacy. Uh, on my bit of the, of the railway, London Overground, we said we carried 50% more customers during the Olympic Games. We reduced delays by 50%. Um, it says one point there, the ER blue light, blue light response. That's our maintenance teams by actually putting a member of the British Transport Police in the maintenance team's vehicle meant they could have a blue light so they could go through traffic lights and get to fix failures quicker than they would normally do so. So that's what we did last summer. Now looking forward to what London is doing, Crossrail. What is Crossrail? Well, it's a new railway. It's a new tunnel through the centre of London linking two existing railways either side. It will have 24 trains an hour, 200 metre length trains to start with, and it's estimated to carry 200 million passenger journeys each year. Everyone talks about world class, and the chief executive of Crossrail came to me and said, Mike, what do you think world class is in terms of operation? Because no one had actually written it down. And we've done some work um, through, through, through our own team and through consulting others around the world. And what we believe is the most important thing in, in a world-class system is to deliver the performance. That's the frequency, the punctuality capacity. That's what the customer wants in the end. Interesting, you might think, why haven't we put safety as number one? Well, we believe customers come onto our systems and inherently see them as safe. Safety is important, but it's seen as an inherent part of the system. So number one is performance, customer care, in other words, delivering that customer satisfaction. We've seen what we did on the overground and how that has been responded to in numbers of customers. <coughs> the other areas there, and that is broadly the order that we feel, certainly on Crossrail in London, what we, we are looking at world class to be. So Crossrail is often badged as Europe's largest infrastructure project, 14.8 billion pounds, that's nearly 25 billion US dollars being invested, fully funded, 37 stations, picture there of one of the eight tunnel boring machines being lowered down a shaft um, just before Christmas. 6.2 meter tunnels, so full size tunnels, not like the London Underground, but full, full size capacity. That shows the route from end the route Maidenhead into Paddington is existing railway, the route from Stratford up to, up to Shenfield on, on the east, on, on the right of that map, again existing railway. The red bit in the middle is the new tunnelling that will link those two together to make new journey opportunities. Benefits, well, it reduces crowding on existing services. London has seen a a continual growth of recent years in terms of demand on, on the tube. And as I said, 2007 hit a billion journeys in the year, and it's gone more since. Bring regeneration. East London, a lot of investment has gone into East London because of the Olympics and the Paralympics. Further investment in East London will then link that into the centre of London. 
journey times, typically, if you're coming to Heathrow, you'll be able to get now to Liverpool Street much quicker. 25% saving on your journey time, trains from Crossrail. That just shows the central section. That's where the tunneling is going on at, at the moment, uh, with five tunnel boring machines un underway. Around about four kilometers of tunneling already completed. The aim to finish tunneling by 2015. Eight new underground stations, huge, massive stations. The um, top picture there shows Paddington, which is effectively a cut and cover station, dug by dugging down an existing street next to the already um, mainline Paddington station. The bottom picture shows Canary Wharf station. Um, the station's underground. That is a hot shopping centre and public park on top of it. Um, and if you go there now, you'll see the structure already in place. But Crossrail, as I've said, is more than just a rail project, it's more than a railway. Um, above a lot of the stations, there'll be overstation developments generating more income to fund the project um, and to generate that economic growth. And as well, of course, as building a railway, it's providing new skills. Crossrail, we've invested in what we call Tucker, the Tunnel Underground Construction Academy uh, in East London. That's training people in tunneling and working underground in construction. And we haven't built sort of major tunnels under London um, since the Jubilee Line uh, and then the Channel Tunnel Rail Link. So getting those skills in place and that will then create employment um, for people in London. Again, apprentices as well, taking people, unemployed people and giving them new opportunities. Where are we on the programme? Well, that shows where we are. Um, Tunneling well underway, all procured, all stations are now procured um, and under construction at different levels. Rolling stock, we're um, in the throes of the first round of that with the aim to down select to two suppliers by the end of March, uh, awarding in April 2014. Signaling contracts already awarded, um, communications, power systems are in evaluation now. Test and commissioning will then start. Um, 2015 on, on the surface sections with a phased opening um, such that the full, full system will be open by the end of 2019. So that was a very much a whirlwind tour, trying to hit my time slot. What do we learn from London? You know, we have that legacy of 150 years of London Underground. We've learned that in everything, system performance is key get the system performance right, get the customers liking it, get the customer satisfaction, they'll turn up and use it. We have an integrated network. In London, we have the, the ability that if there's certain parts that are closed or disrupted or congested, there are other routes. What we found in London Overground, in that because it is predominantly an orbital system rather than a radial system, the 400% increase in demand shows that people appreciate radial systems as well as the orbital. They can travel around London. Uh, on most of it, they don't have to pay, even pay a zone one fare, so it's quite inexpensive, and they can get to make new journey opportunities. Technology, apply it appropriately. Victoria Line was the first railway with automatic train operation. Crossrail will have automatic train operation through its central section, but not on the surface section. What we've also found is that by re removing staff, customers don't actually appreciate. By having a member of staff available, get them out from the behind the glass screen, get them out from the ticket office, onto the station, dealing with customers. It makes people feel secured. It makes people feel cared for. It, it also makes it personal. And final point is there that pretty obvious projects being wider benefits. Not only do they create the end product, but they provide employment both during construction and afterwards and caused regeneration. We've seen that on London Overground, the East London line, part of it, going through East London, Dalston, a very poorly served area in terms of rail. You see massive regeneration. You go there now uh, and you can count the number of cranes, there are just many, many, many of them. <laughs>